once again we say good afternoon to you wherever you are today here on the various stations joining in we have a very important presentation for you at this point in time and uh, joining me by way of zoom this afternoon is professor richard robertson he is the uh, leader of the group of uh, scientists here studying the last of volcano of course keeping us updated up to the minute as to what is happening so at this time i'll i'll say good afternoon to professor robertson and and welcome um, good afternoon, um, and thank you very much for allowing me a chance to speak to people. All right, Professor Robertson, we've had uh, some increase in activity, particularly this afternoon, and uh, persons have taken to social media to share pictures and videos, and uh, clearly there's more activity at Lasso Frere. Can you give us an update as to what is happening? Um, yes, well, essentially you have ongoing Explosive eruption and, and and ongoing explosive eruption means that there will be periods during which there would be significant um, output of of, of um, plumes of ash rising above the volcano. And essentially, um, this morning we had one that started about in terms of the plume being visible. It started about 8:41. Uh, we actually saw the signal a little bit before that. Um, and then it went on for a little bit. Um, the signal went on for about 40 minutes. People saw it for, and then, you know, the tremorina associated with it continued for a little bit longer. And it went, you know, a bit quiet, but it's not really completely quiet anymore, this volcano. It, it continued to emit some steam and ash and stuff like that, but not, not in a very vigorous way. But then at about 2.45 this afternoon, it started pulsing again. And, and that the, the pulsing that started then actually went on for a little bit longer, and it, it involved a number of, um, it's difficult to call them explosions, really. It was, it was more like a continuous pulsing of ash, gas, and steam above from up beneath, from the volcano. Um, and those progressively fed each other and got larger and larger. I believe the, the current estimate of how high the plume actually got is up to, I believe the aviation authority said it's up to about 51,000 feet. Um, so that one was higher than the one this morning, which I think went up to about 29,000. Um, that kind of activity is expected. It's Again, we, we're now in a sort of uh, in-between period where the, the, the emission is not so vigorous. Um, the, the activity is, is a little bit quieter. It's, 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 um, it's spring ash and gas and steam still, but not as vigorous. Um, what, what, event, what people understand, need to understand is what essentially happened this morning as you know, Doom was going all the time, and it, it took a little while for fresh magma to come through. Fresh magma has now come through, and it burst through and came out basically this morning. So the, the volcano has now cleared an opening, a, a pathway for fresh gas rich magma to get to the surface. And once that is the case, there is nothing that will stop it from time to time to build up sufficient pressure um, beyond which it will then start jetting ash and steam when it's small explosions. There's a lot of rock there for it to, to break up, but all the domes that's there, the 79 dome, um, 19, the, the current dome, as well as, and I said it rimmed out the top. So there is now a pathway for that magma that is coming from the, the, the surface of the earth as fresh, gas rich, to keep going. Um, the kind of activity that I saw this afternoon was closer to a discrete single explosion and more, as I said, like continuous jetting of ash. That's closer to a kind of eruption the Sufre has been capable of, where it produces very high plumes and, and ash goes into the air for, for a significant um, time. It hasn't so far, from what we can see, produced these flows that go down the mountainside, you know, these flows where the column collapses on itself and goes down the mountainside. We don't have any evidence that it's done that yet. Uh, that's all that's possible. But certainly it has produced a lot of ash and, and therefore, I think when I was speaking to various persons today, including the um, Prime Minister when he asked for a briefing, I was making a point that people need to probably, you know, everybody in Zimbabwe need to be more aware of what the moral kind of ash is, because even if you've been evacuated, it's possible for the ash to get to you. Um, the ashes essentially find fragments of rock, the same rock that the volcano produced, that produces all the mountains we have in Zimbabwe. That same rock is now being pulverized, broken up into small, smaller pieces. So it's coming out like what we call ash. It's not ash, um, don't get confused. It's not ash like the coals in your, in your stove, uh, like when you have a coal pit and the ash. It's not that fine, powdery stuff. It's not only that. There's some of that, 
but some of it could be like the sand that is on the beach. That sand that we have all over the city, black sand, that is essentially largely from volcanic ash. Um, so it has various different sizes. What you tend to find is that as you move away from the volcano, the size of the particles will become finer. So you'll find more dust and powder sort of falling in areas further away. While if you're on the volcano, if you say on the volcano itself, anyway, in, in the eastern flank, western flank, you'll find something that's more gritty. Um, while if you are further away, um, like in, in, um, in Kingston, you would, you'd, um, you'd find something that's powdery. So the ash is variable in its size. Its composition is really um, fragments of rock. Um, it's very strong. It's, it probably would be rich in, in, in silica and, and, and it would be coated in um, you know, sulfur smelling gases. You might smell it, it might have a smell. Um, and it might be slightly acidic. Therefore, if you, if you add, add it to water, say, it might be causing water to become acidic. But the key thing is to, is to try to deal with avoiding the ash, getting into places that you want to get, don't want to get into. So we have to get into a, a habit now in a sense that when you, see a, when you hear about an explosion or you see a plume, when you're sitting down in the south and you see it going up in the air, and it, it, I mean, it, it really looks amazing. I, I think most people would see now. But bear in mind that at some point, that plume is going to spread out. And after a while, the, it can't, the atmosphere that's holding it up can't sustain it, and it will fall down to the ground. So prepare yourself for when it starts falling. So you have to close up your, 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 your well, first of all, you, you, you shouldn't panic because it's just fine particles of, of, uh, of, of rock, really. So you, you stay calm, don't panic, stay indoors. If you're outside, seek shelter. You, you don't want to be in the ash, right? Um, you want to make sure you close up even before the ash comes. You want to make sure you close your doors, um, you know, uh, place damp towels and doorways and thresholds. You want to stop that fine particle from getting in your house. And, and I tell you, if you're in the salt and it comes to the salt, the particles are really going to be fine. It means that you're locking up your, when you think it's going to come, lock up every place. You don't want to get in. Because once you get in, you tend to find that it forms a coating of fine dust all over the house, more or less. And, and that sticks around for a little while. It, it goes on the ground and it, it gets remobilized by cars passing. Um, so lock up. Um, if you're in it, then you need to cover your face with some sort of, of, of mask. A dust mask is ideal, but the, the mask that we use for, for COVID could also work. If you have a damp cloth, you want to not breathe it in um, and avoid doing that. So essentially, I'm saying that people, there's a lot of information out there about, about what to do with volcanic ash. Um, it's not going to cause you to sort of die, but you, it could cause you serious health. It could give you health problems. If you're, if you're prone to respiratory problems, it's fine. Basically, it's just like breathing in fine dust particles, which is not good for you generally. So you want to avoid that. And you want to avoid it getting into spaces that you want you're, you're going to live in. So don't get into your house, don't get into places. So close things up. So you need to prepare for that kind of activity in the coming days, in the coming weeks. And therefore, um, while you could watch the plume from a safe distance, be prepared for when the ash comes to, to make sure that it doesn't disrupt you so much. Um, and, and there's lots of information, as I said. I'll, I'll recommend that you go to the internet. Um, there's, a, there's an international organization called the um, International um, Volcanic Ash Hazard Network that has lots of information out there about the ash. Educate yourself. I think I, I've heard Nemo sending out messages about what you should do or what you should not do during ash. Use that information so that you can you would not be too much put into distress or harm if and when the ash comes. That's, that's, I think that's a key point I'd like to, to leave with people. All right. Thanks very much, Professor Robertson. Just would like to welcome on board those who are joining us by the various radio stations. We have with us uh, Magic FM, Nice Radio, Praise FM, Extreme FM, Star FM, Hot 97, and We FM all joining in for this broadcast. Uh, Professor Robertson, you mentioned uh, the ash plume going up into the atmosphere and falling back. How long yeah. would that process take on average for it to come back down to Earth, so to speak? Um, it varies. It varies. It depends on how high it is or, or how big the plume is. But you could actually see it. In fact, if you look at the plume, um, you could actually see when the ash starts coming towards you. You'll see it becoming hazy from afar. So you could actually see, you see this gray sort of haze moving towards you. Um, so 
it may take a few minutes. Um, I wouldn't think it. I don't think it will take hours. It will be minutes rather than hours. Uh, but if you're close to the volcano, it's going to take short time. But the point is that you should be able to see it. So um, you should have enough time between when the plume goes up and you see the plume to lock things up and to, to, to get prepared for when it starts falling. It's possible that the fallout could be so heavy that um, in some circumstances, if it was a bright sunny day, it could suddenly become quite dark. Again, that's what I'm saying, you, you, could, you could feel, naturally you feel scared because the day turns to night. That could happen. So bear in mind, those kinds of things can happen. It don't mean that the volcano is doing anything different than it was doing. It just means that the ash is getting to you, and that's possible. We think most of the ash will go offshore. Most of the ash is going to the east and the west. In fact, people in Barbados, in fact, probably going to get more ash than some people in southern, southern parts of St. Lucia, places like that. The fine ash actually gets even further afield. The fine ash from 1902 went as far as Jamaica and went as far as South, South America. So that's how far it could go. Um, ash in volcanic, in some volcanoes, when they really have big explosions, the ash circles the globe entirely. The fine ash, that's how, how much they get. Once they get into the atmosphere, they just float along and keep going and keep going until they fall back to the ground. In our case, I suspect a lot of the ash is probably not going to get more south than, say, Barley on one side or Connery, but there might be occasions that it would. But you can see, you could find out, you could know what to do and make sure um, you're, you're, if you, for example, if you live in, in an area that is close to going to have plenty of ash, it would make sense, for example, to tape up your windows outside with plastic to stop the ash from coming in. Because I'm telling you, it's not pleasant <laughs> for the ash to get into your house, and that is difficult to get rid of it. Um, so, for example, if you if you have heavy ash fall, if, you, if you're outside and you're, you're coming inside your house, you don't want to bring all that ash outside. So, to take off your shoes that are full with the ash and your clothes and stuff like that, and then come inside. You want to stop it from coming inside because it's so fine, it gets remobilized and things like that. So, I'm just saying, prepare for that. The other thing that you want to do, is that you want to clean it away as, as, as it happens. Because remember, we might have periods of explosive activity over the next few days. So therefore, one set of ash fall might happen. And if you don't get rid of it, another set might come. And if you don't get rid of it, another set comes. And it just builds on each other. And what happens with the ash is that it gets, if, it, if the deposit gets thick, and even if it doesn't get thick, when you mix water with this ash, it becomes, and it dries out. Then becomes something like a wet cement. It, it actually gets very, very hard. And then getting rid of it after it's hardened is more difficult. So when it's soft and, and loose and it just fell, you know, use water. I mean, you don't want to. If you're going to sweep it out, put on a dust mask to protect yourself. Get it, get it off your roof if you can. Get it off your porch. Get it away from the house. Um, drive it away so that when the next one comes, it doesn't accumulate and, and, and produce a problem. I'm just saying that people need to gain their head now. That's kind of what we're into for the next couple of weeks, this, this kind of ash, ash problem, um, which is not pleasant, but it's a reality of, of life in Zimbabwe at this point in time when Supra erupting like this. All right, and before we go across to the, the Prime Minister, uh, as it relates to lava flow and, and the concern there, I know we're into the, the yeah. explosive stage now. Do you have any concern regarding this being an issue going forward? Right, so, I mean... I don't know what people mean by lava flow. For me as a geologist, when I say lava flow, I mean um, a, a moving mass of essentially something like liquid rock, a moving mass of rock. Um, and and it, sometimes it's going to be very fast. Like if people think of the Icelandic eruption or Hawaiian lavas, those are lava flows. Our volcano, in its current life way of operating, don't produce lava flows simply doesn't because of the fact that the magma is so sticky. And as soon as it comes out, it, it, it stops itself. That's why it produces a dome around the shape, mass of rock. That doesn't flow, right? So I don't expect to see any lava flows, firstly. What I'd expect to see is more, in this period of eruption, more explosive or venting episodes with lots of ash being produced. And sometimes you might have flows of material down the mountain side. But these we wouldn't call lava flows. We will call them pyroclastic flows or gravity currents or density currents. Essentially, they are material which, instead of going up in the air and getting caught up in the plume, they fall back to the ground. It's a bit like when the volcano erupts, and instead of it having enough energy to carry this material up in the air, 
it starts carrying it up and it doesn't have the energy and it just falls back on itself. And that same hot material falls back and goes down the mountainside. And that, these density currents or these pyroclastic flows or the French call it noir dance, these are some of the most dangerous things from our volcanoes. And that's in fact one of the reasons that you would move people off of the volcano itself. I would not be surprised to see those happening. Um, these will tend to be mainly down the river valleys. So places like the Arabica, the, the, the um, Walibu and, and Roseau and all those Larakai, Balen, all those river valleys that drain the volcano, those could have pyroclastic or density currents coming down them. And they would destroy everything in their paths. They would bulldoze things out of the way. They would cause fires. They would produce deposits. Those, those shouldn't cause any harm to people because nobody should be there now, right? Because we've asked that people move. And if you're in those areas, if you're not at the Rabaka driver with this volcano erupting like that, that's an extremely bad idea. If you're, if you're in those areas that are supposed to be evacuated, that's a bad idea because some of those same things I'm talking about and also very thick ashfall could affect you. Um, if you're like living in ash, you could stay in those areas. If you're like living without ash, move from those areas. If you like living full stop, you should move from those areas. So that's what I would expect. It doesn't leave lava flows, no lava flows, but dense decurrence of pyroclastic flows. That's definitely possible. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Robertson, for bringing us up to date uh, right. as to what is happening. And, and, uh...